morning. Thank you so much, Brian, for the generous introduction. It's wonderful to be back here in Abu Dhabi, uh, home, a place I consider home. And by extension, I think all of us today are really uh, family. So I'm looking forward to this intimate uh, day and conversation with all of you. So I think the right way to kick things off is to acknowledge that when we talk about macro, we cannot simply focus only on the traditional macro drivers that we think of as shaping global society and the economy, meaning growth rates, inflation, interest rates, unemployment. We have to look much more broadly. The world has become too complex to reduce our future forecasts merely to economic logic. Instead, what we're going to do today, and what we must always do, is to paint a more holistic, integrated picture that brings in the geopolitics, brings in demographics, and indeed brings in climate as well. And then you're going to get a much richer picture in, against which, or towards which, you can invest with higher conviction in the future. So that's what I mean by the new global macro. But let's start with the economic picture indeed, where you could create a number of divisions or taxonomies, starting first and foremost, of course, with traditional mature advanced economies, meaning the United States, uh, North America, uh, Europe, versus um, what I'm characterizing as the ascending economies. I don't really use the term emerging markets anymore. I think about ascending and descending. And primarily, when we talk about ascending economies, we're certainly talking about Asia. You can see the latest forecasts uh, from the IMF and other sources where even with all of the engines of debt running and monetary policy trying to revive, stimulate Western economies, the best outlook is 1% to 2% growth rates, whereas if you break down the ascending Asian markets, you're looking at anywhere from 4 to 6 plus percent. And that's the secular momentum that we're going to explore in a bit more detail. If we look case by case, and I think we'll talk a lot about this today as we get into the individual regional drivers of the world economy from a macro standpoint, there is a positive consensus about the U.S. in terms of getting towards a soft landing in light of um, inflation coming under control, um, you know, uh, probably a freeze in interest rate hikes, unemployment certainly very low. Um, but the cost of that, obviously, has been this massive expansion of the fiscal deficit that has led to, uh, you know, downgrade by Moody's very recently. Not the first time that's happened, uh, so that can be kind of, you know, swept under the rug for now. The big question to be asking about the U.S. is the tension between um, the the fiscal uh, drivers and the, and the policy environment that's favoring a reindustrialization, which is very, very promising, versus the political uncertainty about what happens in the next election cycle. And that's what we're going to need to be watching most of all when it comes to the US. When it comes to Europe, there is certainly more challenges. Uh, the term that I use here is a really a decimation uh, of demand. They're finding it extremely difficult, to fi despite the overall large population size and the presence for a long time of industrial policies that they may well reinforce in the future to really stimulate economies, again, to actually um, uh, uh, generate the kind of growth uh, that they need to, interest rates being flat. Now they're concerned, obviously, as we head into winter about higher energy costs and other things. But what could go right is what has potentially gone right as a trigger of European integration in the past, which is crisis. Europe learns from crisis. Many people like to discount Europe and think of it as peripheral and too much of a laggard and overregulated. But if you look historically, whether it is geopolitical events, whether it is um, the, uh, the, the financial crisis, which prompted them, and in COVID as well, to push towards more of a fiscal compact, now a capital markets union. And if you look at the way in which Europe has been able to transition away from, uh, from dependence on Russian oil and gas as exports, all of these are relatively positive trends. And so there is potentially a macro hope for a European collective uh, recovery. Now, Asia, we're going to talk a lot more about, but focusing just a, you know, a brief word or two on China, no doubt um, you can split uh, Asia into two, of course, sort of aging Asia and then uh, you know, younger Asia that has a bit more of the momentum. Uh, we can see that in China right now some drastic actions are being taken uh, to redirect fiscal policy away from the traditional infrastructure stimulus into, uh, into, into businesses and into households. And as I said, young, emerging, ascending Asia, what I have called the fourth wave of Asian economies, meaning South and Southeast Asia, really have the momentum today, attracting a lot of uh, fresh investment and capital and taking advantage of the geopolitical uh, shifts 
that are promoting foreign investors to try to diversify their supply chains uh, into other uh, Asian economies. So let's dig a bit more into this. What I basically said by focusing on these three mega regions of the world economy, the way I'm depicting them here is more in purchasing power parity terms and these uh, clusters that appear as cartograms, right? A cartogram takes data and, uh, and, and, and visualizes it in this way. And what I'm focusing here on is, uh, is uh, PPP adjusted measurements of GDP, by which of course you see not only is indeed China the largest economy in the world, but Asia is already more than 50% of the world economy. If you couple that with what I mentioned earlier, which is the higher growth rates, you can clearly see that the Asian future uh, is, is quite assured in terms of its centrality in the world economy. And note also the color coding where really some of the countries that we've traditionally thought of, and by traditionally I mean going back 20, 30 years, as being leaning towards the West, aspiring to join the West, be accepted in Western clubs and institutions, now see their fate being more and more tied to their relations with Asian, ascending Asian powers. You can see that in the case of Turkey, you can see that in the case of Russia, and so forth. And here, of course, we have the Gulf countries and, uh, and sort of West Asian economies in red, the GCC with a combined GDP of $4 trillion, sitting in the middle and navigating in that multi-directional macroeconomic environment and choosing its partners. But clearly you have this tripolar uh, system. And polarity in, that, in this case, in the economic context, isn't just one nation or the other. Right? It is these clusters that are more and more integrated, which is why we need to think more in PPP terms anyway. If you think about the ways in which um, domestic or regional production, local pricing, the role of domestic consumption in driving GDP goes forward, you will more and more see these regional clusters uh, uh, forming. And that's a story that actually goes back about 20, 25 years. I'm showing you here, for example, is what I call the Asianization of Asia. That may be a mouthful, but it really is the singular megatrend of the 21st century. It isn't just the rise of China. The rise of China is part of the story of Asia coming together. But this is a story that in particular takes us back about 30 years since the end of the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union. It's since that time that we have seen every single sub-region of Asia begin to intensify its relations with the other parts of Asia. So what I did to craft this is not only to color code uh, the sub-regions so that they form these, these clusters like ASEAN and, and GCC countries. Note, of course, I'm putting uh, our region here of the Gulf into this category of West Asia, right? And this is something I've been uh, arguing for a long time. In geography, there's no such thing as the Middle East, right? It's very much an artifact of a British colonialism and British strategic cartography, but it's not a geographical term at all. In fact, we are here have always been and will always be West Asia, and now there is a growing realization and embrace of the fact that here in the Gulf we are the western edge of Asia. And if you can see each of these lines, I've gone back 20 years, 15 years, 10 years, five years, and what you see is every single one of these has gotten thicker. In other words, the volume of annual trade in goods and services between any two pairs of major states or sub-regions in Asia has been growing over time. Um, so this is something that's very significant because if you go back to the Asian financial crisis of 1997, 1998, that is when Asian countries started to realize that they have to find ways not only to uh, bring down their internal borders and frictions, achieve greater self-sufficiency, trade more with each other, leverage the complementarities that they have with each other. Then came, of course, the global financial crisis, which was a major demand shock, and again, Asians said, how are we gonna to respond to that? Let's make sure we trade more with each other, right? Of course, during that time, you also had the commodity super cycle, which really kicked off and accelerated the relations between Gulf countries and East Asian nations. And then you had Trump and Brexit in 2016. You've had COVID. For every one of these shocks of the last uh, 25 years, the lesson has been Asia needs to do more with Asia. And indeed now, following from the previous map, this zone, this Asian zone, is becoming ever more self-sufficient. It's not that America wants to decouple from China. The big decoupling is that Asia itself is becoming more and more self-sufficient and needs the rest of the world less than it is integrating by itself. And all of that, despite the spectacular diversity 
of civilizations and cultures and nations and states on this map has been achieved in under three decades. And the reason for that is that there's also a deep uh, historical, I'm actually gonna jump ahead and show you this, there's a deep historical instinct that we associate with this term Silk Roads. How can it be that everyone from Japan to Korea to China to Russia to uh, Arab states, India and Indonesia have managed over just 30 years to arrive at this situation where they trade and invest more with each other than with the rest of the world after 500 years of colonialism and the Cold War, right? If you were to, had to sum up 500 years of history, you could actually do it in three words, colonialism, Cold War, right? And what happened to Asia during that time was that, of course, these societies, these cultures that once did, through the Silk Roads, have more fruitful and intense relations that dissipated, right, that, that petered out. And it's been recovered in such a staggeringly short period of time, so much so that we revive this terminology. There's a term here that many of you may never have seen, Afro-Eurasia. But any sociologist or historian of the pre-colonial world prior to 500 years ago knows that Afro-Eurasia was the global system prior to the discovery of the Western Hemisphere. It was Africa, Europe, Asia, and the terrestrial and maritime Silk Roads. And what is happening today is that the Indian Ocean is once again the center of global goods trade, as we know. The societies and economies along the periphery, maritime and, and terrestrial Asia, Africa and here in West Asia represent the majority of world GDP, majority of the world population, majority of world trade. And so what it is is a return to the Afro-Eurasian system. And now I'll jump back, if it will allow me, to showing you how that's taking shape over land. Just about uh, um, a couple of weeks ago, Beijing hosted the Belt and Road Plus 10 Summit. Uh, and that was meant to celebrate, in some ways, the achievements of the last 10 years with Chinese-led infrastructure finance and new trade corridors developing. And I've been mapping out these uh, kind of routes. Every line on this map represents either an oil or gas pipeline, a railway, an electricity grid, a internet cable, and so forth, that are really crisscrossing this uh, Eurasian region, or this Asian region. Now, just to reinforce a point, this is a rectangle, this is not a sphere. This is not the entire world. However, based upon both the data and the demographics, remember that about 60% uh, of the human population of our planet lives inside this rectangle. That is not only true today, that will literally always be true. In fact, the gap will widen because even if you have high fertility in regions like Africa, remember that Africa only has one-fifth of the Asian population. The Asian population also continues to grow based upon relatively high birth rates in the fourth wave economies I was talking about earlier, South and Southeast Asia. And so reconnecting these countries, optimizing their ability to trade with each other and connect to global markets is what not just Belt and Road is about, but the entire process of rehabilitating the, the, the Silk Roads, if you will. And that's been supported by Europe, been supported by Japan, been supported by China. And now, in a way, as you know, there is an infrastructural arms race going on in the world today. When Belt and Road was announced 10 years ago, a lot of people viewed it as a geopolitical force projection mechanism by China. And indeed, it is to some degree. There is globalization of infrastructure and trade networks are not distinct from geopolitics. They are a tool of geopolitics. But what we've witnessed in just the last five years is that whether it is Western powers or Western powers with Japan and India have started to step up and say, we're not going to have let only China finance this infrastructure, we're gonna compete. We're gonna offer our own concessionary finance, we're gonna compete for infrastructure projects and trade corridors. Just recently, um, uh, when India was hosting the G20, it declared an India, Middle East, uh, Europe uh, corridor as well. These are viewed sometimes as rival initiatives. The, re the way connectivity actually works is that it in expands the total uh, uh, sort of global public good of connectivity, right? It is more, more non-rival than rival, even though it is presented in that way. In other words, all connectivity generally is good connectivity and it's dual use. It's used not only by the power that financed it, but by others as well and overall increases the resilience uh, of the system. So I view a lot of these projects 
some of them are Chinese sponsored and backed, but many of them are not. And in this infrastructure arms race, the winners are the countries that get more and more connected and build that optionality in terms of who they're gonna trade with, who their investment partners will be, who they'll get their technology from, and so on and so on and so forth. So I fully expect this map to continue to evolve. And as it does, it is going to achieve that economic multiplier effect that infrastructure has proven to do for generations and centuries, really, uh, in a way since the colonial imperial era. And what you can do with maps like this, when you're thinking about it as an investor, as an operating, as executives of operating businesses, is to look and see where do, where do the demographics of population concentrations like cities overlap with the transnational infrastructures that are being built to provide the energy, the communications, the transport corridors that bring those goods to market, and look at those markets as the, in a way, uh, hubs where you can be more and more confident in your future investments. So all of that leads to a couple of points uh, around the geopolitical architecture of the world because a lot of people think about the future of geopolitics as simply being able to reduce it to a G2, right? It was a unipolar world and now it's a bipolar world, but credit to Mubadala for making the theme of today, navigate a multipolar world. I think of multipolar as meaning more than two. And going back a couple of decades, I've argued that really the future is not going to be able, you're not gonna be able to reduce it to such a simplistic formula of a G2, of a new Cold War. Rather, in a connected world, countries navigate what I call the geopolitical marketplace. Think of geopolitics not as a monopoly of one or a duopoly of two, but a marketplace of all regions of the world interacting with free association being able to forge these partnerships in different functional areas. In other words, who am I going to work with as a security partner or military partner? Who am I going to get my infrastructure connectivity from? Who's going to launch my satellites? Who's going to build my 5G um, communications network? Who's going to uh, provide or who am I going to buy my solar panels and my uh, hydrogen power from? The truth is the answer isn't always binary. It isn't either one or the other. Europe, India, Japan, Everyone is competing to be a trusted, in a way, utility provider in every one of these thematic areas. So that's the real future of geopolitics, is actually this marketplace of vendors and suitors. And as countries get connected, they are choosing from this global menu, in a way, of providers. And that's really what I think of as a very, in a way, stable structure. So rather than one flag being at the center, we know that's not really true anymore, but it isn't China's flag that replaces the American flag. It isn't any flag, right? It's a world in which because you have had a graduation, an evolution psychologically from colonialism and the Cold War, you have dozens and dozens of countries, countries like the UAE, of course, that are saying we're not gonna pick a side, right? We're not gonna pick one side or the other side. Instead, we are going to practice multi-alignment. And navigating a multipolar world is about smartly multi-aligning. You can see Southeast Asian countries doing this very cleverly. I live in Singapore and I read in the press all the time that Southeast Asian countries must choose sides between America and China. Well, actually no such thing is happening. Instead, when you look at the technology firms in the region and you look at the, the, the way in which capital uh, is being assembled to finance uh, new technology ventures. You have Japanese investment, Chinese investment, US investment, European investment, local investment, forming regional champions that are not playing second fiddle to a uh, dominant incumbent player from the US or China, but are competing with them and displacing them and even branching out internationally on their own. That's the reality of a world in which countries are aware of history, in which they have been dominated but don't want to be anymore, and instead want to be players in this geopolitical marketplace. And that awakening, and the UAE represents this so well, is contagious. It's, again, a sign of psychological evolution in the world in which countries want to be players and decision makers. So now, we've talked about the macroeconomic, we've talked about the geopolitical, we've got to bring in the third new macro driver, uh, demographics and climate. The demographics I mentioned earlier, again, most of the human population as you see here is Asian, but now let's talk about what is happening with accelerating uh, climate change. If you look closely at this map, you have the human geography of the world. Every, there's eight billion pixels on this map. 
But if you look at what the climate forecasts are as temperatures rise, and last week there, there was a dubious uh, distinction or there was a, you know, a, a very ignominious event, which was that uh, the world average temperature did cross the two degree temperature average threshold from the pre-industrial levels. That's not supposed to have happened according to most climate models for a couple of decades from now, it's happened already. And this is the thing to remember about climate. It is a uh, complex adaptive system. Our biosphere does not snap back simply because we are investing a lot in decarbonization. And yes, we should, trillions, not billions, but even that is not enough. And so we have to think about adaptation, what that's going to mean. Some of the most populous regions of the world, particularly South Asia, for example, are among the most climate stressed. And this means that either a society is going to adapt or economy is going to adapt or it's going to be hit by more and more of the so-called green swans. Now, the difference between a black swan and a green swan is, of course, with a black swan, you're not supposed to be able to predict when it occurs, a low probability but high impact event. The thing about green swans is that please don't pretend that it's either low, low probability or unpredictable, right? Just look at insurance premiums, look at the annual damage from catastrophic natural disasters and so forth. It's only going one direction, sadly, that is up and to the right. And this means that the difference, the differentiating factor between winning and losing societies of the future is gonna be whether or not they ad adapt. And mitigation has dominated the agenda. We have the COP summit starting literally at the end of uh, next week. And there, and with all the previous COP summits, all 27 of them, the focus has been very much on mitigation, 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 decarbonization. We can clearly see Mubadala has been a global leader in investing in those areas. But who is investing in the necessary adaptation that is really our insurance policy? And that means, what do we do about our infrastructure? What do we do about our populations? What do we do about um, uh, managing ecosystem stress? not just trying to slow temperature rise, which unfortunately we're not doing a very good job uh, at right now. And so you have to quantify climate impact, bring it into our calculations around sovereign risk when we're thinking about where we want to be investing. And this is very much a geographical question, right? When we're having this macro conversation, the ultimate result needs to be forward guidance on the geography of future investment. So had we not existed in a climate change world, I showed you which geographies are getting the most connected through new infrastructure investment and population shifts, that's important, but now you have to look at which ones are adapted to climate change. And one proxy for that is what is happening with their real estate markets, because real estate is by far the largest sector of the entire world economy, and unlike other sectors, it is unfortunately immobile, right? It's almost built into the definition. So how you physically adapt the geographies for real estate is gonna be very significant. That's well over $300 trillion uh, of total estimated value of the land and property in the world, which by the way is about four times global GDP. So real estate is a very, very important barometer. Now it's stressed for many reasons, of course. You have the global commercial real estate market stress because of rising interest rates and lower occupancy as a result of COVID. On top of that, you have the climate stress as well, and you have the demographic plateau of the world as people, in a way, nav arbitrate which geographies they would prefer to be in, uh, in a world where they can choose. So the approach that we take is to try to quantify resilience, because risk alone doesn't tell you the future of a place. You need to look at how resilient the place is to those climate shocks. We're very focused on the risk side. Everyone knows that climate models are built on flood, storm, heat, fire, drought, sea level rise. And we look at those trends, we look at how scary they are, and when we discount locations. But in fact, to know the result, to know the outcome, which places are gonna thrive, you have to look at the right side of this sphere, which is who is investing in the resilience? Are they decarbonizing their energy grids? What's the share of renewable power? What is the demographic uh, health and vitality of a society? What is the diversification of the economy and its momentum? All of those things historically backtest statistically to the performance of a location, and they help to offset the climate risk. If you create this integrated picture of risk and resilience, you'll get a much better sense of which places are going to uh, survive into the future. And I believe, uh, to, to wrap up, those are the places, it's actually classically Darwinian, right? It's not just the survival of the fittest, but fittest is actually defined as those that are most adapted to change and volatility. So adaptation, more than just physical risk, is going to make the difference, and gonna, it's going to help you decide where you want to be invested. So, what we are trying to do is to 
geographically pinpoint and identify those locations that demonstrate the highest adaptive capacity to whether it's geopolitical risk, are they a multi-aligning country that's playing all sides, right? Two, demographics, are they attracting populations in the way uh, the UAE is? Um, and are they climate resilient? Are they retrofitting their infrastructure? And if you impose these filters onto a map, you will have, again, a much higher conviction on where you want to be investing. And so I give you a stylized uh, map here, in a way, of some of the locations that I've been researching and, and, and traveling and, and investigating, whether or not they're migrant friendly, whether they're diversifying their economies, whether they're investing in the right infrastructure, um, all of those things to get a sense of the geographies of where you would invest in the future. And interestingly enough, I may have mentioned earlier at the beginning that you know, Europe is a place that people don't have a lot of confidence in investing, but if you look at the climate picture and the investment in building, in a way, um, uh, a, 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 a more uh, sort of adapted zone, right, with clean energy, uh, with renewable resources, and preparing themselves for climate shock, Europe is doing a better job than other regions are. This is not the total answer to locations where you should invest, but these are places that I view as partially doing the right thing, and so each star corresponds to a country or a city or a province uh, that I've traveled to to look at those policies on the ground and say, I view these as places that are going to be, um, in a way, that are future-proofing themselves very cleverly, and I'll conclude by pointing out there's a star right there, of course, uh, for the UAE, right? And this is, no doubt, if you look at just the climate map, even the very one I showed you earlier, which comes directly from the IPCC, you would say, why would anyone want to live here? People who haven't been here say to me all the time, what's your fascination and love affair with the, the UAE? You know, look at climate change, I read all these articles, it's gonna be so scorching. I said, well, the whole world is going to face some climate uh, externalities and be affected negatively in various ways. However, again, which place is adapting? And look at what the UAE has done with everything from the energy grid, uh, coastal mangroves, air conditioning, uh, flood controls and protection, all of these things, seawalls that can be done and will be done here and in other places, and relatively compare to places in the geographical catchment area and say, well, where would you rather be? And in this world in the future, people and investors are gonna vote with their feet and they're gonna invest in the places that have done the best job of adaptation. And so this country rightly earns its place uh, on this map and in our list. And so I hope that over the course of today, not only through this initial uh, presentation, but as we talk about how we test and measure the resilience and adaptation of societies, that guides us towards the map of where we need to be investing in the future. Uh, so with that, my time is up. Uh, thank you very much. Look forward to our discussion today. Thank you.